Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Edmundo Resendez. On today's Fronteras, we take a look at Latino immigrants who have an impact on our community. Paula Nava Madrigal is one of a few number of female music conductors in the United States. Madrigal is an immigrant from Mexico. She has made it her mission to bring classical music to immigrant and refugee youth who normally would not have access to classical music. The following story was produced by Leila Kazmi. My name is Paula Nava Madrigal. Hi. I'm a conductor and I'm a music teacher. I have been playing music from I was 15 years old and I start singing when I was five years old. I start conducting because the conductor to the orchestra in the university in Guadalajara, he gets sick. And when I did it, I love it. And after that, I traveled to Mexico City to start my first conducting workshop. I came here because I got married with a guy from Seattle. He came to Guadalajara to play like solist. And after two years and a half, we got married. The role of the conductor is really to make sure that the composer's written score comes to life. Um, from rhythm um, to knowing when instruments crescendos, diminuendos, to the depth of a music score. And the conductor really brings that out to the audience in the way they interpret it. I feel alive when I'm conducting the orchestra. I feel the music, I feel connected with the composer, and I feel connected with the musicians because when you are conducting, you can see the eyes to the person. You're talking with the eyes when you are conducting. My first viewing of Paula conducting, I got emotional because it was, yes, of course, the music. Second, it was that she was bringing in uh, Latino composers in these performances. Third, it was that she was a Latina. She was Mexican. Uh, she looked like me, she, uh, her parents were brought up like my parents. For being a conductor and be a woman is difficult, but I thought here in United States I could f find more women, but no, it's the same. I'm, I'm a woman, but I'm a woman of color. And for the, the women of color, it's more difficult. For the kids of color, it's more difficult to have access to the, to the classical music or to the music education. For that reason, I have my programs. First string, what is the name? E. Play. OK, we need to have our violin up. We want to offer free music lessons uh, for immigrant refugees or all the people that need it. OK, stop. Only violins. So I have two programs. One of the programs is in Casa Latina, and another is in the World School. Aha, uh -huh. yes. OK, do it. We provide the instruments and the music, and we bring the music stands too. We came from Piwala. Uh, it's a little bit far from here. Sometimes we spend more time on the road than on the classroom, but it is a good chance for our daughter. The music is a very important thing for our kids because they can increase their potential mentally and the spiritual potential to grow up and do better in their lives. Do you want to play this part? you want to try? Hmm? When you study music, it's not only like you learn to play one instrument. It's that you learn how to behave with your classmate. You learn to listen. You need to be patient. You need to be part of something. You need to have discipline. You need to practice. No, they learn tools for the life. What 
that she represents is another aspect of our community that we are also into music and classical music as well. That is something that is also rare um, for the Northwest um, to have Latinos in classical music. <laughs> When you have different kind of minds on scales, you're more strong. When you have one single point of view, you don't have anything. You know? But when you have different cultures, you are rich. I love music. I have music in my head all the time. I have melodies, I like to sing. I like to hear music, the music moved me, the music made me happy, it's my life. I can't see the, mu the life without music. In Manifest Destinies, The Making of the Mexican-American Race, Laura Gomez, professor of law, sociology, and Chicana and Chicano studies at the University of California, Los Angeles, delves into the roots of Mexican-American unique place in our nation's racial history and its relevance for today. Professor Gomez is our guest on Fronteras Changing America. Professor Gomez, welcome to Las Cruces. Welcome back home to New Mexico. Thank you, Edmundo. I'm delighted to be here. Always happy to be in New Mexico. Now, you were born in Roswell, but you were raised in Albuquerque. What was your upbringing like in Albuquerque in, 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 the, in the time that you went to school and you graduated from there? Yeah, um, well, one of the things that, that, well, what motivated my parents to move to Albuquerque when I was two years old was that my father was starting college at the University of New Mexico. Oh, interesting. So he was an older student with already a family, and this was in 1966, and the Chicano movement was, was getting started on college campuses, and my dad was a founder of UMAS, which was the United Mexican American Students Association. And so my early childhood was a lot of being around a lot of students, and and activists and sort of you know we'd go to rallies and we were just kind of in that milieu of, of, of social change and I uh, was taught very early about the heroes of the black civil rights movement as well as the Mexican American civil rights movement you know we boycotted grapes and all of that and as I as I continued in school I went to public schools in Albuquerque New Mexico elementary junior high and high school um, I, I realized that it was quite different from many of my classmates, right? Because they didn't have that experience of having uh, a parent who had, had gone to college was and was politically very aware, right? And, uh, and, and, you know, I began to sort of see that I had much in common with them, but also had sort of this different lens. For example, I grew up saying I was Chicana. Right, that wasn't always the case with um, other other the other Hispanic kids that I went they to school with. They grew up being Hispanic, right, or right. by some accounts Mexican, or even Spanish, Spanish sometimes. And, you know, so th those are the kind of things that I write about in this book is all that variation. So, how important was education in your upbringing? Oh, it was critical. Um, so. Uh, my father went on to get a master's in sociology from the from Berkeley. Um, so we just grew up, my brother and I just grew up uh, knowing that we were going to go to college. And my mother started going to school part time at what used to be the University of Albuquerque. And she got an associate's degree in nursing. And then later, when she was, after she was a grandmother, finished her bachelor's degree in nursing at the oh, University of New Mexico. So I think we were all, all in this, th there was a very strong sense that uh, we would, we would, we had to do well in school. My brother went to Notre Dame. Um, and then and I went off to, to Harvard and it was it wasn't something that we had planned but I always knew I was going to go to college. What was it like to graduate from Albuquerque and make that move to Harvard to Massachusetts being a Latina yeah. a Chicana you know in the 80s? It was this was 1982 I graduated from Valley High School uh, in Albuquerque's North Valley probably my school was probably 80 percent Hispanic um, and, uh, and you know, uh, I, I went out one time to visit the school. They had a kind of, for minority students, a, a weekend where we could, we could fly out. We, they flew us out and we could 
meet students and get a sense. But other than that, I had never been to the campus. I, I got to Boston Airport and I got in a cab with all my stuff and went to the dorm and found out that all these other kids had their parents drive them there and, and move them in. But you know, the those of us from New Mexico um, and there were three other uh, Mexican American young young women who went Oh, they were all women? Yeah, all of us really? uh, women. There yeah. was four There of was guys. four of us, me from Albuquerque, one from Santa Fe, one from Taos, one from Raton. Um, and it was a whole new world to us. It was a whole new world. I mean, at the time, the only Mexican restaurant was this chain from the Midwest. It was called Chichis. I'm and familiar it was with Chichis. terrible Mexican food. It was terrible Mexican food. I you, lived in the Midwest. You couldn't even so buy, yeah, you couldn't even go to the store and get tortillas there. Now in Boston today, it's very different. Mm -hmm. You can get Mexican food everywhere, right? There are all kinds of wonderful Mexican restaurants and so forth. But it was, it was a shock. And, well. As somebody who grew up in an activist environment, what was it like at that time in Boston for you to assimilate into yeah. not having that kind of environment there? Well, actually, I, I mean, you know, it's interesting because there were, there were about 35 Mexican-American students in each freshman class at Harvard during the years that I was there. Okay. And uh, most of them were from California or Texas, right? A lot from the, the uh, the valley in Texas, um, or from Houston or San Antonio or Dallas, and in, a lot from LA. And we had a very strong organization. In fact, there was a group called the East Coast Chicano Students Forum. And we would even get together with the Mexican Americans from Yale and from Princeton. And we'd have a, a Thanksgiving uh, pachanga because we couldn't afford to go home for a short trip, right, all that way. So it was it was really broadening my world because, you know, getting to know Latinos from other places, getting to know Puerto Ricans for the first time, uh, you know, that was a whole new world that was opened up to me, uh, uh, learning, learning different music and different food and learning how to salsa and merengue and, <laughs> you know, um, so it was a really interesting time. It was, my world was so much bigger because I went out there. What made you decide to pursue a law career, but in particular a Chicano and Chicana studies background? Well, when I was when I was at Harvard, I became very active in writing for the school newspaper. So I was a journalist with the Harvard Crimson, and I took that writing very seriously, and I really honed my writing skills. And I started to apply those writing schools in my academic courses and decided in college, toward the end of college, that I wanted to be a professor. And then it was kind of, well, what kind of professor do I want to be? And I think that part of me always felt that doing only a PhD in sociology, which is what I was interested in doing, might be too isolated from the world, whereas I thought if I have a law degree, then I have this kind of more practical side, you know, and so I decided to do both of them. And uh, when I was, I was working for Jeff Bingham in, in, uh, in the Senate um, after college, and that's when I started applying to graduate schools, and I applied to both law schools and PhD programs in sociology, and I did the two degrees together, just because I thought that that was the kind of intersection that I wanted to do. But I was always interested in race and racial justice and civil rights, and so kind of ethnic studies was, was just developing at that time, really. I never had a, a course on Chicanos or Hispanics at Harvard. Mm -hmm. But when I went to Stanford, I met my first Latino professors um, and uh, started doing more of, of I think, uh, a work that was more, um, you know, I, I, I encountered a whole different set of fields there at Stanford. Let's talk about your book, Manifest Destinies, The Making of the Mexican-American Race. What catches my attention is Mexican American race, yes. not ethnicity, but race. Yes. Why is that important? Right. Yeah. I I was really trying to do that. The title is deliberately provocative mm -hmm. in just that way, because we do tend to think about Mexican Americans, uh, and there are lots of good reasons why we think about Mexican Americans as an ethnic group, uh, our immigrant background, um, the fact that 
Mexican Americans have a racial ancestry that is complicated because we have Indian background, uh, the uh, we have uh, the Spanish background, but we also have the influence of African slaves in Mexico, which was very significant um, in the not to mention the Caribbean. Yeah, absolutely, areas. absolutely. So, so we have that that complex history and it, we come to the United States and in the United States we're often thought of oh is, you're an immigrant so you're an ethnic you're an ethnic group but what I was trying to suggest by the title and what the book talks about is that Mexican Americans have experienced intense racism in this country and therefore thinking about them as a racial group in comparison to African Americans really helps us understand a lot of American history and so when we go back to the 19th century and thinking about well, what happened in 1846 when the U.S. invaded Mexico and then in 1848 when the U.S. forced Mexico to, um, to surrender and then uh, give up half of its territory to the United States, what happened to those Mexican Americans? I call them the original Mexican Americans because they were the people who lived in that huge Mexican session territory. There were 115,000 ethnic Mexicans who living in that territory. Who suddenly went from being Mexican citizens to, to American citizens. To being American citizens under the treaty, right? But it was really a very tenuous kind of American citizenship, right? Second class citizenship for sure. And I'm trying to put that, that period of American history into conversation with what comes later with the Civil War, not that much later, the end of slavery, right? The, the, the uh, 13th Amendment, 14th Amendments to, to the Constitution, and how does that, how do those pieces of, of race fit together in the tapestry of U.S. racial history is what really what the book is about. Where are Latinos today? Well, I mean, you, know, you know, I think it's a... What, the reason I ask that question is because in particular with you growing up, doing the Chicano movement, seeing your father, in the 60s, the 70s, and for me growing up in Houston in a Chicano environment mm -hmm. where, you know, it was very prominent in the community where you had lowriders, there was mm -hmm. a lot of pride. Mm -hmm. Over the years, politically speaking, you've seen almost, I don't know if shaming is a strong word, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. you know, you have people that look to Latinos and call them illegal immigrants mm -hmm. or have mm -hmm. different names for them. Where are we today? Yeah, I think that there's really been a backsliding in some ways, right? So the, 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 the period where we were like brown is beautiful, building on the black civil rights music, uh, movement and, and sort of saying, you know, we were embracing our indigenous uh, past and, and kind of reclaiming that has been affected by the national discourse on uh, uh, about immigrants. And so a lot of Americans think that Mexican Americans are primarily immigrants, which is not the case. Um, they think that we are all immigrants, that we are all undocumented immigrants. And uh, even, even other Latinos, for example, there's research that shows that Americans, whites, white Americans think that Puerto Ricans are immigrants. You know, and Puerto Ricans are not immigrants, right? They can come freely, go back and forth freely between the, the island citizens. and and the U.S. Well, they're they're but they're second class U.S. citizens because they can't vote for president. Mm -hmm. The island of Puerto Rico doesn't have a voting representation in Congress, right? So they're kind of in this in between status. Uh, but all of us are, I think, brought down by the the hatred that we see in the present moment. Um, for example, during the presidential election, when uh, then candidate Trump was berating Mexicans and kind of conjuring the specter of the Mexican rapist and the Mexican drug dealer and the Mexican criminal, uh, that was not so different from the notion of the black predator who's a criminal and, and a threat to uh, white women, for example. So, you know, you see these these evolutions and how we think about um, people at the at the in this rhetoric and at the national level this ends up having some effect on our day-to-day -day interactions and how people are treated by the police or how people might be treated by their neighbor 
we see rhetoric as part, uh, it's as American as apple pie. It's existed for generations. You saw the rhetoric exist when you had Italian immigrants, mm -hmm. when you had Irish immigrants mm -hmm. who were ethnic at the time, but over the years they've become mm -hmm. white Americans. Mm -hmm. Do you see Latinos becoming at one point in our his mm -hmm. in the future as being labeled as white? Mm -hmm. That's a, gr a great question. I want to just just go back to something you said. So, yes, at certain points in our peer in our history, Italian immigrants, especially those from southern Italy, were viewed as a different race, and there were lynchings of dark-skinned Italians in the South. Um, Irish immigrants at certain points in our history were viewed as, as definitely not white, but over time those groups became very solidly white. Now with Mexican Americans, I think it's been a very different story. At certain points in our history, and in particular I think in that 19th century moment, you can see that there's kind of in between and, and maybe some of the privileges of whiteness applied to us. I think today, we're moving in the other direction where, yes, in the census, in some very formulaic way, yes, we can say that we're white, right? And in the state of Texas and the state of New Mexico and state documents, you know, we can technically be white, but most people don't think of Latinos as white, right? So when you look at surveys and they say, would you like to live next to, um, next to, Latinos next to Hispanics, they would say no. Would you like your, your daughter to marry a Hispanic? They say no. You know, there's still that, that uh, racism. It's less than what African Americans experience, but it's still very distinctive. So I think we're moving in that, in that other direction of very, becoming very clearly on the other side. And one, one signal of that is if you look at the language in the media of, of, of non-Hispanic white, Right, so it's like kind of like well, Hispanics may be white in some sort of artificial sense, but the real whites are the non-Hispanic whites, right? Um, so we're in a moment, I think, of a lot of change on this question. You know, I I, I could be wrong about where we're headed, but I think that we're going to be for this period of the next several decades in this interesting place. And part of it is because of the demographics. We're 17% of the US population now, but we will be 30% of the US population within our lifetimes. And so that, that growth also is threatening to a lot of people. Where do you see the activism of today's Latinos? You know, you have the Chicano movement, yeah. the brown pride, brown power. Where do you see the activism headed for you as a professor at UCLA in the Chicano, right. Chicano studies? Well, I was talking to a student today, um, actually, who said that their political awakening came as a high school student in 2006 when there were all of the rallies across the country against the Sensenbrenner immigration bill. And that bill was defeated largely because of that that activism, you know, tens of thousands of Latinos um, protesting. And the, the Dreamers movement really came out of that moment, right? So if you talk to those young people, they were, they were politicized in that moment. And now that is a central debate that we're having in this country, right? Where are we gonna go on, on that question? Um, and I think that now I think these young Latinos, immigrants themselves or the children of immigrants, they're demanding their rights. They're demanding that they be treated with respect and with human rights. And, you know, in a way, I think they're forcing us. Our country has always had these great aspirations for liberty and equality, and they're forcing us to live up to those aspirations, right? And we, every couple of generations, we go through this again, and we went through it with African Americans in the civil rights movement, but now we're in a different kind of civil rights movement where I think these young people are really holding our feet to the fire and saying, you've got to step up. Why was it important for you to write this book? And who should read your book? Well, I hope everybody will read it and they can order it on amazon.com <laughs> easily. Okay. Um, or read it at the library. Um, it, it's, in some ways, it's very much for that younger generation, for my son and, and his peers, the millennials, right? Because they don't see their history. They don't, they don't see that their own 
people's history reflected in their school books and in junior high and high school, right? And I wanted those students to have that experience. I, I guess lectured recently in a, the introductory Chicano studies course at UCLA. And uh, they, they had assigned the book and you know they asked me to come and lecture. How many students do you think were in that course? 800. 800. 800 students, and this is, this, for several years, this has been the case. In the introductory course in Chicano Studies at UCLA, 800 students. And the demographics are such that Latinos are a young population, right? Much younger than African Americans and whites. Asian Americans also are a young population, and there are higher uh, uh, rates of, of birth in the Asian American and the Latino um, groups. And so this is gonna be a young population for a long time. And so this is, this is the future that we are likely to have. And you know, in New Mexico, in Texas, in California, in Colorado, but also in Michigan and Illinois and Minnesota, there are Latino studies courses. And because there's a hunger, and this is a growing part of the, the college age uh, population. What advice do you give to young Latinos who might be discouraged by the rhetoric that exists today when it comes to politics? I would encourage them to look for sources of pride and sort of reject that, that hateful rhetoric that they see and instead sort of embrace the fact that, you know, there is this incredible cultural production that Latinos are experiencing it right, right now. For example, the fact that we just had a Mexican-born director win um, and he's the third Mexican-born director in recent years to win for and Coco Best won. Picture. And I was gonna say, that's what I was gonna say. And you know, that's a that's a tremendously uplifting film and uplifting portrayal, I think, of of our roots in Mexico. And uh, and look at those positives. Um, Professor Gomez, I want to thank you very much for joining us on Fronteras of Changing America. Have a pleasant week. <laughs>